liberty and justice for all. Now our Texas flag. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. You may be seated. Jennifer, do we have any citizens' communication tonight? Thank you. Then we shall start our public hearing. It is 6.33. The first public hearing is regarding a request by the City of Van Austin to amend Ordinance Number 538. This ordinance was adopted in 2003 for the Plan Development District Number 3 that zoned properties situated in the County of Grayson, State of Texas, and being a part of the Ashley McKinney Survey. Abstract number 851 and being approximately 126.32 acres, described as three tracts in Ordinance 539, being commonly known as Georgetown Heights, Georgetown Meadows, and Georgetown Trails, and being more particularly known as all of that tract of land described as Tract 1 in a warranty deed from John K. Hines to Hines Acres Limited as reported in volume 3006, page 863 of the deed records of Grayson County, Texas and being part of that tract of land, described as track two in the above side of warranty deed recorded in volume 3006. And being part of that tract of land described in the Linda Cullum Griffin et al. to Van Team Partners Limited as recorded in volume 2558, page 316 of the deed recorded of Grayson County, Texas, to amend the fencing requirements within the zoning classification of Plan Development dis District Number Three, as established in the Ordinance 538. Are there any comments from the audience that they would like to make at this, this time? If so, please raise your hand. Second call for comments. Third and final call. There not being any comments, the first part of this uh, public hearing is closed. We will go to part two, which is a public hearing regarding amending the land use assumptions, capital improvement plan, and impact fee ordinance. Are there any comments regarding this? Second call. Where is that specifically, please? Oh. I live on Bryn Mawr. Oh, Bryn Mawr. Uh, do you know what that is? We're talking about the first hearing, we're talking about the second hearing. We're talking about the second one. The impact fees? Both good. Okay. I just moved there. Okay. Oh, the first one is in Georgetown, in the mm -hmm. south part of Georgetown. That's the fact in Georgetown. Okay. Okay. okay, that was the first one, and yeah. it is in regard to that. The now fence, we're at the second one. What's being I have no idea what's being proposed for the fencing. Leave it like it is, other than being short. Um, the recommendation from PNZ was to, uh, if there's going to be, the double fencing would not occur anymore in, the, in that PD. In that double fencing. Double fencing. Two fences right up against each other. Mm -hmm. But there had to be adequate spacing if there was going to be a double fence. It had to be 36 inches. As well, uh, PNZ uh, planning and zoning's recommendation was if there was going to be double fencing that it could not be inaccessible, that there had to be a 36 inch gate uh, installed by the person that was the last person to create the double fence. However, the uh, people that run our district as far as heights of fences and so on, but uh, I, have a, I have a point that I want to approve. Okay. All the fences are about six to seven feet high. Okay. Uh, I live in the back of my house is in this wide open area of farming. Okay. But 10 feet from my backyard, there's a, it's about this much dirt for about 60 feet, and anybody can walk. I have 14 windows 
uh, booked into my bedroom, and so on and so on. And they can, I can see some people walking out there because they're walking with their dog or whatever. But, so I have no privacy. So, and the homeowners association forbid me to put a higher fence. That's it. And I'm sure my neighbors have the same problem. Okay. So I just want to take it in perspective. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. The second public hearing is amending the land use assumption, capital improvement plans, and impact fee ordinance. Uh, this has been available. What it is, is uh, Uh, it's capital improvement plans and water and wastewater impact fee amendments. Are there any questions regarding this? Second call. Third and final. I declare this public hearing closed at 6.38. Item number seven, approve the minutes from the April 8th regular meeting. Are there any questions regarding the minutes? If not, is there a motion to approve it at this time? Make a motion. I have a motion. Is there a second? second. I have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the April 8th, 2014 regular meeting. All of those in favor, please raise your hand. It is unanimous. Mayor. Yes. I'm, I didn't see who, who seconded the motion. Thank you. Councilman Jessica. Next we have is number eight. And this is consideration and take any action necessary regarding a request by the owner agent Arnold Clark Jr. and Mary Elaine Clark to plant the Clark addition being 9.33 acres in the N.H. Caney Survey, abstract number 431, Collin County, Texas. This is located on Bent Trail. The background on this, uh, the requester is uh, ultimately putting in a divider lot line, dividing lot 2 into lot 2A and to lot 2B, as well as providing a 60-foot right-of-way dedication. Uh, this is a proposed plat that they are uh, bringing before the council. Does councilman have any council have any questions regarding this? We will start with councilman Clark. Yeah, uh, where is? I can't. Fi I can't find Bet Three on the maps that I can look up. The, the it's city of Anaheim. County Road Three Seventy Three. County Road Three Seventy Three. If, if I may, Mayor. Yes. I'm Sam Luscom, and I work for the. J.E. Smith Survey Company. Yes. We represent the Clarks. And uh, County Road 373 is the dividing line uh, between the Anna and Melissa School Districts at this time. Okay. So if you're going south on Highway 5 yeah. and you get to where the new Anna Public Works building is, yeah. if you'll go west on that, like you're going to go to the old town side of Mansion Way. Okay. <laughs> This, pro this, this property is about three quarters of a mile, if that much, okay. east northeast of the uh, old town side of Mantua. Okay. And so it, it is not in the city uh, city uh, limits. It, it is in the extraterritorial jurisdiction. jurisdiction that ETJ okay. on that. So that's why uh, that's why uh, as per uh, the city's ordinances, we're here to ask uh, for the uh, permission to uh, subdivide. Uh, the property according to the city's uh, ordinance in compliance with the ability to have uh, that power within EEJ. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any more questions, Council McClain? Um, I don't believe so. And this is in the school district? It is in the Van Alstine School District, yes it is. Do you have any questions, Council Just out of oh. curiosity, what what is the, uh, why they want to do what they're doing. They're, uh, they they own 9.33 acres at this time. Uh, as uh, they're approaching their retirement, uh, there's a twofold. If I if I may say this, uh, 
they have uh, more land than they can uh, say grace over on that, and it also will help to uh, 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 improve their portfolio to uh, sell this lot off. Thank you. Councilman Justin. No questions. No questions. We're not getting any other questions in this. Um, what you are requesting is a plan that the city would provide them. Is that correct? Second. That they are requesting a plan. They're requesting to replant. To subdivide and replant. Replant it. This is at no expense to the city, correct? Correct. <coughs> At this time, is there a motion regarding this? I make a motion to uh, allow them to replant the property like they want to. We have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. It is passed unanimous. We will now hear a presentation from Kenneth, I'm probably going to say this. Manica. Manica. Of the Dallas-Garland Northeastern Railroad Incorporated and the Texas Northeastern Railroad regarding the railroad crossings in Dallas. Jean, and we have a presentation. Farms is going to see if there's someone here that can give it to us. Thank you. Thank you. You might sit in her over there. Those crossings. 
Um, I'm going to refer to some of my notes and see them, but rail, the rail industry is experiencing a rapid large growth across the United States, and projections are only for that to increase. It reduces the traffic on the road systems, it takes trucks off the roads, and it's only getting more and more of a system in the network that we operate on. Every single rock car that we operate, you see going through your town now eight days a week, that's the uh, 110 tons of rock. A single triaxle hulls 25 tons of rock. So each one of those cars represents four trucks that are not operating on your highways or your towns and creating congestion. So that's the, the, one of the driving forces behind it. If you pay attention to any of the big railroads around here, BNSF, UP, KCS, you see that they're hauling one train will haul 200 containers. That's 200 trucks that don't go on the road. So the rail industry is experiencing an enormous growth right now, even in the down economy. It's one of the industries that didn't suffer the downturn in the economy because as people look for cheaper methods of transportation, the rail industry is that answer. We're also seeing a boom in the industry of passenger trains. We don't currently have anything in this area, but that doesn't mean it won't be coming because of the congestion experience. And if you're unfortunate like me and have to drive through it every day to Dallas, it'll make more sense to you. Um, there, there's a program called Operation Lifesaver, and they are, their large purpose is to reduce collisions at crossings, educate the public, they teach in schools, they go to fire departments, they work with police departments, first responders, they're the guys you may see standing at the crossing one day with a handful of pamphlets trying to educate you on why you need to stop. And through largely of their work and the railroad's cooperation, since 1972 there's been an 83% decrease in rail at great crossing accidents. That's a huge number. But there's still a lot of crossing accidents that happen, and the challenges for us as a railroad are growing with technology. It used to be worried about just the car, the truck, the school bus stopping on the crossing. And I've had the unfortunate experience of being there with a kid with headphones on because he's listening to an iPod and doesn't hear that train. So the technology now with texting, distracted driving, it is more and more critical for us, and the reasons those collisions occur are now the wider scope of colleagues. It used to be just, I was distracted because the sun was in my eyes, and they pull out in front of the train, and now there's many other reasons. So Operation Lifesaver, TxDOT, and a lot of other agencies have taken the approach that we reduce crossings, we reduce the opportunity for those collisions and those accidents to happen. So there's many programs, and every state's different. TxDOT, PennDOT, New York, I've moved seven times, lived in seven different states. Every state has a program where we try to close crossings, reduce traffic to one point. It makes it safer for the public, it makes it safer for my friends. Um, today's trains are also bigger, longer, and faster. When I hired out 16 years ago on the railroad, if you ran an 80-car train, it was a big deal. Now we run 130, 160-car trains. They're longer, they're faster, um, and the trains are getting quieter for noise pollution. So as they increase in size, they increase in tonnage, they increase all this massive amount of energy, but yet they're quieter. And if you work on the railroad, it's an eerie feeling to be standing in a rail yard and a car will go by you and you never heard it coming. A train that's not under load through the terrain such as we experience on the McKinney sub is what we call this out here, it's undulating territory. So if they're in a valley, that train's coasted. It's not under load. And it'll run past you and you'll never hear it coming. Because steel wheels on steel rail is dangerously quiet. So that's another reason we want to protect the public and keep them at protected crossings where we can control their safety a little bit better. Um, the statistics published by the FRA, the Federal Railroad Administration, that's the governing body over railroads, they dictate a lot of our rules, a lot of things we have to do at crossings. There's active crossings, that's like uh, Highway 121. You've got gates, you've got lights, you've got bells. The trains are required to sound a specific cadence for a specific amount of time to warn the public. That's all governed by the FRA. Um, that's why quiet zones don't exist, because that becomes so expensive for a quiet zone that they don't exist in many places anymore outside of a hospital. On our railroad, we have one in 388 months. So we're governed by that body as well as our own rules. Um, the statistics show that a active crossing, states like 
flashings is 90% more effective. 90% more effective than just cross points. That's an unprotected or a passive crossing. So having gauge lights and bell is 90% more effective than just having the X that says railroad crossing. In the last three years, this is the Federal Railroad Administration statistics, there was 8,172 crossing accidents. 870 of those were in Texas, which is the highest number of crossing accidents in the United States. Texas ranks number one in train vehicle collisions. So in 2009, and the federal government statistics lag, so I couldn't include 2014, the 2013, 2089 reported crossing accidents. There were 742 that resulted in death in that three year period, and 73 of those occurred in Texas. Um, they couldn't, they wouldn't allow me to break down by um, active and passive on that, which I find odd, to be honest with you, but I couldn't break that out. But our train that typically runs through your town of Van Alstine is approximately 9,000 tons. Not 9,000 pounds, 9,000 tons. A triaxial weighs 25 to 30 tons. We're pulling that with two to four locomotives, depending on which ones we have on that given day. That's 374 triaxles worth of rock that are running through town. That's a lot of weight and a lot of momentum to control. The weight ratio of a train to an automobile is proportional to an automobile hitting a soda can. If you ever run over one on the road, you know what happens to that soda can. I've had a very un unfortunate experience for 16 years now of responding. I, I'm the guy that has to go and I can't count them anymore, but I can see every one of their faces. It's very uh, emotional for me because I've seen so many. And so crossings are near and dear to my heart because anytime I can not have to go one of those, that affects me, it affects my family, but most of all, it affects that person in the car and it affects that crew that's on that locomotive who's sitting in front of a windshield looking down on the car that they're about to strike knowing there's not a thing they can do about it. So anything I can do to help protect the public is very important. At 10 mile an hour, current speed on that line, it'll take us at least a half mile to stop that. That's a half mile down, and then that conductor's got to get off and walk back to see if he can render assistance while the engineer's making phone calls to get 911 Next year, we're going to take that line to 25 mile an hour because the volume and the business has grown to the point that we're going to invest quite a bit of money in that line that we've started this year. Mr. Cox is doing a phenomenal job improving the conditions on that line. And at 25 mile an hour, it's going to take a mile to stop that train. That's longer than the distance from one end of your town to the other where we're close to crossings. That's a long distance. It's a lot of momentum. We can't stop on and down. And out of all the accidents I've been to, I've never seen the train lose. I've been there when we've hit cement trucks, triaxles, school buses, Tractor trailers, cars. Never seen a train move one. They win every time. Most crashes occur when the trains are traveling under 30 mile an hour. Higher speed rail requires a lot more protections, a lot more uh, safety precautions. That's part of the reason. But at under 30 mile an hour, when you look down the rails at that train, it looks like it's crawling. And it can be moving at 30 mile an hour. They think they have a lot of time to get across and they don't. We'll be increasing our speed that you've been accustomed to seeing out there since we took over the line by more than one and a half times. Currently it'll take our locomotive just to head in six minutes to cover one mile. We will be covering it in 2.4 uh, minutes. We'll cover one mile. So that's a big adjustment to get used to so the protection of the, the public at the crossings becomes more important. The horn and bell requirements that we are required by the federal government, if there's no crossing horn sign, that just means for us it's a whole whistle post that says W on it, and we just start blowing the horn. But in absence of that, they have to start to signal at least 15 seconds, but not more than 20 before that crossing. It's two, two shorts, a long and a short, four, four blows of the horn. And if there's no sign, they start a quarter mile before the crossing. They have to repeat that cadence until the crossing is completely occupied. With seven crossings at 25 mile an hour, we're going to be blowing that horn from one end of town to the other. 
it would be a consistent blow. And we operate 24 7. So by reducing the crossing, it reduces the amount of noise that we're going to make coming through the for all hours. The tracks have had various owners and usage over the years because the question has been asked why now? Why close these crossings? Well, this track was the main track long ago before active crossings existed. Then the line went to the UP. They ran five mile an hour. Pretty slow speed, it's pretty easy to control. Then the line got abandoned and nobody operated for a while. DART, Dallas Area Rapid Transit, purchased it in 2000, and that was actually four, I'm sorry, I had a typo on my presentation, and leased it to us. We began operations to service McKinney and our biggest customer, the Lattimore Rock, Rock Line. And as businesses increases, we're putting the improving the infrastructure to make that trip a lot faster. There were seven crossings in Van Alstine between Polson and Old Mill in eight tenths of a mile. To put that in perspective, in McKinney, where we go, in two miles there's only eight crossings. So there was a heavy abundance of crossings in town, and only two of them are protected crossings. And that's Highway 121 and Tolson Avenue are active crossings, they're paved, and they're open. East Van Alstein, West Fold, and East Houston were all passive, meaning just the cross box. They don't even have a stop sign there currently. And they were gravel. The railroad there runs on a dike, meaning it's peaked. You have an uphill approach on one side and a downhill on the other side. We get regular calls for trucks centering themselves on those crossings, getting stuck which causes a large amount of damage to us. When we pulled the crossings out recently to do maintenance work, we found a fair amount of damage. We don't always get notified. And if that truck catches on the, on the rail and causes me a wide gauge in my train rails, we're gonna spill 70 loads of rock through Van Alstine. We'll have to make a parking lot out there until we get it cleaned up. So that's another reason for the safety of our trains and you with crossings, we can't have them. Um, Austin is paved but passive and currently remains open due to its, its entrance into the cemetery. <coughs> we are working with DART, TxDOT, myself, and uh, Van Alstine to obtain funds to convert Old Mill to an active crossing. It's going over to some businesses. There's a large amount of truck traffic there. So we want to work to update that crossing from passive to active. A brand new active crossing starts at $150,000 for one track. That is single track there. I'm working with uh, mostly Frank to find a way to do that a whole lot cheaper and with government funds and a contribution from DG Note to make that an active crossing. So that way there will be an active crossing on the north end, one in the center, and one on the south end of town. Um, with those crossings, we will work with the city to improve the pavement and the concrete panels on 121 to make those smoother crossings. It's not beating up your vehicle as much when you go across them. When we get done with the work we have, we'll develop a plan to improve those crossings as well as far as the, the road path for them. Um, we did go through and cross those crossings at our expense. While we were doing the work, we had barricades up and citizens weren't even paying attention to the barricades. That made me very nervous. If they're not going to stay away from the road that's closed with the barricade out that says stop, why are they going to stop on my railroad tracks? I watched them drive around the barricades and go over the crossing. We drove the posts in the ground, and we already caught three people going in between the posts and driving over the rail that has no gravel. They're beating their car down and up and smashing the rail up. So why would I want to leave open a crossing that's dangerous when they're not listening to the signs we have? So we need to go to an active crossing system there to protect the public. And we're, we're exploring more options for Austin. Currently, we'll just take uh, Old Mill to an active crossing. That's the last question. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, thank you. I will take a break. We'll see if the uh, council has some questions regarding this. I know I do. We'll start with Councilman Moore. Do you have any questions regarding this? No. 
Councilman Flood. Yeah, uh, 3133, is that outside? Or? Yes. So uh, is it going to remain? Yes, no plans other than between Tolson and Old Mill. That's the only thing we're looking at right now. Okay. Any more questions? No. Councilman Jackson. So we're, you're looking at leaving four at the moment, is that right? Currently, yes. I heard you talking about three and I heard you talking about four. Okay. Um, This going, uh, are these changes going to be on down the line? I mean, are you going through all the small towns that the railroad's coming through, yes. or is Van Austin? It's there? an ongoing, constant process where we're always looking for crossings that we can reduce. Um, and, and the big win is when we can make one an active by going to close and another one to force traffic to that direction. But yes, it, it, I've been I'm new to this position. I came in September, and as I'm learning my railroad, there's a lot of towns we run through that we have to evaluate the process. Um, couple of questions on the cost. Um, Council received an email that said that those crossings to put the arms there, whatever the cost of the uh, cost between two hundred fifty thousand and five hundred thousand to, to put those in, and, and you're paying one hundred fifty. Is that which? That's what we've been paying recently on the DGO you know, for the on crossings. Is that is the one hundred fifty? Yes. Okay. If there's multiple lanes of traffic, if it's a four-lane road, or if there's multiple tracks, we end up two tracks side by side, three tracks, the price escalates pretty quickly. But the, but the rate we, that we're talking about for Van Austin is the 150,000. Yeah, and most likely it'll be far less than that. With We have some materials that we're going to contribute to the project. Because this happens so fast, um, we're, we have some materials we'll contribute. and. The price will basically be to the contractors that wire in a ton of the wires to wire everything up. Okay, now you, you said because this happened fast, what, what caused Van Alstein's uh, crossings to be closed? What, what caused the, the what, what made it you expedite that activity? In a week, I probably got that, that week we had multiple calls for people getting hung up on the crossing. Mm -hmm. I went up there to work with the contractors that were going to regulate camping fixing the track and when we saw the conditions because it's not so easy just to dump rock back in. The ties have to be removed, they have to be changed, there's certain lengths, there's different spike patterns. To do all that work for our crossing and we had half the work already removed when we were going through our routine maintenance and then watching the fact that the public was not obeying the traffic signals there just sent chills down the spine and that's when I immediately started the process. Went to close the process. Um, I drove down Highway 5 today through Anna and Melissa, and there are some crossings. There's one in particular that has concrete all the way up, and it's a nice, nice smooth crossing. It goes into a, uh, a newly developed housing uh, plan development. Right beside Latin. And there's no crossing like that. There's the gates. Is that, is that something that will be done on the crossing like that, or is it because it's so well Install, but there's such a smooth surface going across that. Does that contribute to that? No, is that the, the, there are plans in place for that housing development as it grows? The, the money's already been allocated for that to become an active crossing. Okay. We will have gates and lights. The first step was getting the, the crossing in, and all the wires are laid. Okay, so it's now, the railroad people that I've had an occasion to talk to said that the railroad's responsible for in the time and in the time on a crossing. Is the city responsible for maintaining the um, the, the travel worthiness of, of that crossing, of the, the tracks going up to it, the, in between the rails? Yes, we we own the right of way. We don't own the city streets, so the approaches on both sides of that crossing would be maintained by the city. Okay. The crossing we maintain. The crossing itself is the, the center of the city. Okay. 
that, that had been moved back and forth in discussions on who was responsible for what. If, if the city was more responsive to maintaining a, a higher quality of crossing, would that have made a difference to, to you? No. Okay. Because, I mean, you would have to lengthen those approaches a significant amount to take the peak out of that railroad, and they still would be past the crossings. And now you've got eight opportunities, or seven opportunities coming through town, or car being in front of the train. And in that short of a distance to have that volume of crossings, when you have parallel streets on both sides of the crossing to get around, it doesn't make sense to increase the opportunity. Okay. I'm sure you you have you because you, you've said you're concerned about safety, and I'm sure having a job where it's it's your responsibility to visually inspect accidents the, the, that's got to be an emotional thing. Jefferson Street crossing as, I mean, there are signs on both sides that warn trucks that it's, uh, that you're going to get hung up if you're not careful. One's down on the, the one coming west is on the ground, but um, the one on the east side is, is still red. When you're coming across those, those tracks, you can't see coming in from John Memphis, but you can't see the street. And especially some of the law enforcement that I've witnessed, that go by just as a blur in front of Jefferson going across those tracks, somebody pulling out that cannot see what's coming across the tracks. And those people going too fast across the tracks can't see on, on John Douglas. Is there any anticipation of any signage that will warn people about that so so they can learn to maybe better watch for it? Because there, there will be an accident there somewhere. There's, there's no doubt about that. That's unfortunate, and that's and that's a city problem. Right. But you're 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 making your problem our problem, and and I want to be sure that we take steps to to warn the the driving public that there's an accident across the tracks waiting to happen. We don't want you to be in. I guess my question is, how involved will you be in that process, if it, as far as warning for street traffic, and if there's a possible issue? We don't direct any street signs. We put up railroad crossing signs, and any street signage is the responsibility of the town, the city, state, depending on the highway. And West Jefferson is 1.1, that's a county road, right? It, it, well, it's, 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 uh, it's um, takes it's off responsibility. Sign. One thing I've seen, uh, we haven't discussed it, uh, is there a way to mount mirrors on the crossing to where people can see up and over the tracks? Or, I mean, I know you're smiling and laughing, but I, I, I believe I've seen it somewhere. Um, there are certain things that can be mounted on that pole where the cross box, the lights, the gates, and bells are. That's not Put right. anything else on there, okay. and the FRA will take exception to it. You could mount a pole adjacent to it or something of that nature. We can work with you there. But as far as mounting on that pole, no. Okay. Um, it causes a lot of lines. Okay. Yeah, I have several questions. I've talked to, uh, in talking with some of the residents, they've been quite concerned as to why uh, there wasn't prior notification. Uh, yeah, I know as a council person, I got an email at after five on Thursday and uh, Friday morning you were out there working. Uh, why wasn't there notification to the people and to the council so that uh, people could be aware of what was going on in our town? Because it was found and dealt with swiftly because of the safety nature of that. We couldn't put those crossings back in the proper way, in the safe way, without a large amount of maintenance. So the decision had to be made quickly. How many accidents or things have we had in this strip of... Um, I honestly couldn't tell you. I don't think we've had many. If, you know, it's been years since there's been anything. I've lived there for 20 four years right on the tracks and I haven't seen it and I was just concerned that uh, consideration wasn't given to our people. Uh, I'm sorry you feel that way ma'am. I did take consideration because I'm keeping you safe and I could not. Those crossings were going to be closed until maintenance. I don't have the materials to do it. That wasn't in the scope of the work. 
they would be closed at this point anyway. They had to be closed to be repaired properly. Okay. Uh, was any consideration given to the people of Van Alstine? For example, uh, in talking with some of the citizens, things that were brought to my attention is that we have one section called Poor Hill, and that is because the people are not are in a, 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 a class where they are considered poor, uh, you're disadvantaging these people. I don't understand. Well, they have to travel further uh, all the way around, and they feel very unsafe at, at the 121, uh, waiting for an accident to happen. I have asked the question whether uh, of the city, whether uh, John Douglas Road will be improved, uh, the parallel street on the other side, uh, and we need to consider the citizens. Not, I mean, yes, I understand safety, but my concern too is if you're upping the speed to 25 miles per hour, I live on the track. If a train derails, what safety or protection do I have as a citizen? We're doing the maintenance work, we're doing improvements, we do regular inspections. We ran a Sperry Park that is a MRI type machine on that rail, it just completed this week. We're changing every defect you can't see with the human eye. We have installed, and I can't quote you the exact number, but it's in the thousands of amount of ties. We replaced bolts, joint bars. We have done, we're doing our due diligence to keep you safe. We are doing our part. We've gone above and beyond our control of measure to make sure that doesn't happen. But hitting somebody at that crossing, I'll put it in your front yard. And yeah. right now, if, if you forgive me because I don't know your town as well as you do, but the crossing you're concerned about is one north of East Jefferson. Oh, that's one. Uh there are several, of course, Fulton. <clears throat> Fulton is one of them that is a problem. And like different ones said, you know, it, it's hard for the, the people uh, to, if you know the streets in Van Alstine and try to uh, navigate around, it is very difficult to get to one of the open crossings. And it is an inconvenience, number one. and a disservice to our citizens. Yeah, and I apologize that you feel that way, ma'am, but eight pro or seven crossings and eight tenths of a mile is an excessive amount. You don't have that downtown Dallas. It, you have more crossings than the population center you have when cities four times your size. And that increases my risk, my liability on those crossings, as well as it does the cities. It increases risk and liability for everyone that's open. No, that's all. Okay. I have, I have a question. But first I want to share something with you. I received a phone call from one of our residents. And she said, I want you to know when I go to the cemetery, it's just awful. I think that they should do something about that crossing and repair it, and I want you to take care of it. Well, the next thing I know, you put up calls. And she calls me. And she says, I wanted you to fix it. I didn't want you to close it. <laughs> so I just want you to tell them what you've done. I did not know I was so powerful. Uh, I can understand why people are concerned, especially at 121 and John Douglas. It, it is extremely dangerous because if you want to come into town off of John Douglas, and perhaps the city will be able to. Uh, put something up there that we can prevent an accident. I'm, I've been in that a long time, and I remember uh, that I remember when Oscar Moments was killed later. I remember to Stephen's family. I remember several who, before you put up the bells and the signals and the arms, how dangerous it was, especially at night. So we really do appreciate that, and we do. I do think it is very important that we have guarded crossings because you realize how people do not pay attention even when it's guarded. So it's, it's double trouble. 
the only concern that I have is one that really isn't in the city, but it does concern me greatly. There is a crossing, there is a road called Spence Road, and it is on the uh, north side of our elementary school, between the elementary school and the high school. Middle school and high school. The middle school. I'm sorry, middle school and high school. Spence Road comes and it crosses Highway 5, and it goes over the railroad track. A lot of our teenagers go over that crossing. And if you've never ridden in the vehicle with a teenager going over that crossing, you just haven't lived. Because it's almost a one lane. It goes over a hill and down. It's not one of these. It's past that. But due to the fact that, that that's where the ag barn is, and a lot of them come down and go over that hill going to our ag barn instead of going further north, that uh, perhaps you could look into that crossing due to the traffic of teenage drivers that want to go take care of their animals at the end. It's, uh, I don't know, it's Spence Road to Highway 5, and I assume it's over, it connects to what would be, uh, you come over the railroad track and head out of town. So it would be the, um, the last one that you have that is uh, guarded, which is on Tolson Street. It's past, it's the crossing just past Tolson Street, but it's on out. But due to the traffic of teenagers, I think it would certainly be worth time to look at that crossing. I know they're invincible, but so is the train. That's one chain train that screws on the east side. Mm -hmm. Sir? It's, it's kind of steep and right? Yes, it's really steep, and it's almost one way. And when you're coming over that hill, you don't know what's on the other side. But you are, you do know the one I'm talking about. And it, I believe it to be heavily traveled by, by teenagers. So uh, uh, that to me is the only concern that I have. It's not a part of this, but I would like for you to consider it since you do have that faith. Absolutely. Uh, we thank you very much for your presentation. I'd like to say something about good. Good. Yes, uh, I agree. When you close it, uh, the affected lead is the Bellstein Parkway right here. And uh, they talk about all the dangers of the others. And uh, I may be selfish, but mine is the better. It's level, more level than the other two. And uh, also, another thing during the Christmas parades, what are y'all going to do? Like, uh, y'all normally close off to 121 at the Christmas parades, and y'all go through the Bellstein Parkway. Right? Uh, Redirect traffic. So what are y'all going to do next year? <laughs> More likely we're going to have to divert down to Austin yeah. or down to Martin. Yeah. Yeah. So we think. I'm just saying that mine is uh, that was sure. a lot, lot safer. It's a yeah, lot sure. safer than yeah, we use Austin Parkway for uh, for Father All as well as far as redirecting traffic. So there's going to have to be some logistics uh, changes. Thank you very much for your presentation. And we'll the next item on the agenda is number 10, and this is to consider and taking any action necessary regarding the request. And this is uh, regarding the request for the amendment uh, uh, for the plan development. Uh, to remove the fencing requirements within the zoning classification of the planned development, District Number Three, as established. Uh, are there any questions regarding this? And I'll start at the other end. Council, no, I have no questions. Questions? Uh, the question on the rates for um, impact fees. That's in number one. Sorry. Okay. I think it's not going to do that. Councilman Jessica, do you have anything regarding the fencing requirements? Councilman Moore? No. Councilman Clark? No. 
If there are no, since there are no questions, is there a motion at this time? I make a motion to approve the changes to this amendment uh, uh, to the. Uh, Amended changes. Yes. <laughs> Thank Where you. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion regarding this from council? I just have a quick question. Okay. Are you wanting to approve the ordinance um, as it's presented, or um, do you want to consider, um, I guess, adding the, the sentence that PNZ recommended? Well, this was to amend the fencing requirements as stated Just here. And what I described during the during the uh, public hearing was what PNZ recommended, which was the 36 inch and which we need to Yeah, I want to put that. <laughs> Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? Uh, it is unanimous. Number 11. Consider and take any action necessary regarding adopting an ordinance amending ordinance number 572 regarding land use assumption at capital improvement plan and impact fees. Uh, this is the capital improvement advisory committee met on April 1st, 2014 to review proposed recommendations for amending the city's land use assumption and capital improvement program developed for the city of Van Austin and the ETJ. The CIAC also was presented with revised water and wastewater impact fees based on the current and maximum fees that could be charged under the requirements of the local government code. The CIAC discussed and recommends Approval of the revised land use assumption as submitted. Approval of the recommended capital improvement program as submitted. And amendments of the water and wastewater impact fees to be 2200 for each service based on a 3 4 inch equivalent size meter. 1100 for each new service based on each 3 4 inch equivalent size meter. The recommended amendment to the water and wastewater impact of these are included in this ordinance to be considered by the city council. Uh, this uh, recommendation uh, will amend that uh, water impact fee on the equivalent meter and the wastewater impact. This was presented by Steve White, our Director of Public Works. Do you have any comments you wish to make on this, Mr. White? Not at this time. Not at this time. Thank you. Okay, do we have any questions? And we'll start at my right. Councilwoman Palmer, do you have any questions regarding this? I do. Is this what we have, have been discussed previously? Yes, ma'am. I was thinking that we had a, a lesser amount that we had uh, discussed. I will we'll go on. Mm -hmm. Councilman Smith. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maximum combined impact fees of 9,000. What does that mean? That mm -hmm. means that's the highest we could have charged. Okay. And build a house for the three quarter inch meter with all of the <coughs> fees that all the stuff that somebody has to pay at City Hall before they build a house. How much is that going to be now? Um, Thirty three hundred for water and wastewater and back fees. Okay, but what is the total amount of cost for a building to come into City Hall? Well it depends on the proposed it depends upon the proposed valuation of the project. Well let's let's just say an average home. We'll, we'll pick one of the one of the six that was issued this last month. Are we? Is this going to increase the cost for someone to build a house in Manalsi? If, if we say yes. Okay. 
I don't want to leave this table raising a rake. I'll let you guys do that next month. I'm not going to. I'm not going to vote for anything to raise the rate. Okay, so you're yes, saying you don't want to raise the rate to the developer that you want to put keep the burden on the current resident. I'm water saying water that I am not water impact. Right. I'm saying that I'm not going to sit at this table for the last time and raise rates on anybody. Okay. Councilman Jessica. Councilman Mower. What is the change? What's the difference? Uh, the current charge is $2,316 for both combined <coughs> water and sewer, and the proposed charge is $3,300, so it's a difference of $984. Do we have any? numbers to compare ourselves to neighboring town of Organa. I do. Second to the last slide. Just, just the impact. The tax fee is another fee on top of that. If we do that. understand then what a maximum combined impact fees are. That's the maximum that could be charged. That's not based on we're charging, just what we could. That's based on the government code. If we wanted to charge that much, that would be the maximum allowed under the <coughs> guidelines. He's talking from a slide up here that I'm not sure you have. No, and I'm, I'm talking about it. Yeah. You're talking about this chart right here? Yeah. The 9,000 is the maximum allowed. Yeah. I need one under the local government code. Okay, so that, but we're, we're so all of us and all the other places would be the same on that. 
Every no. I, I would no. suspect that the bulk of these cities could charge a lot more than they are charging. I don't have information on what their maximum allowance <coughs> is. I don't have that as a comparison. Uh, yeah, if I can clarify, the maximum allowable is based on the land use assumptions and the capital improvement program that's also part of this that to serve those new properties as they come in. This is the expansion of the city's existing utility system to provide service to outlying properties uh, as they come in. So this is this is what you're charging new growth to handle the upgrades that the city has to do for the existing system, including extending pipes and you know like that new new water sources. Okay. So, uh, is that like a palladium that comes in here and builds a whole bunch of stuff that's in there? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All, all new properties that come in will be paying the impact fee, which is uh, the uh, the capital program that we showed shows us looping the water lines so that we don't run out of service and we have enough supply. It includes the connect. You know, part of the capital improvement program also includes the uh, CGMA connection. And, and upgrading that pump station and providing that new water service to the rest of the city, okay. you know, that we talked about in expanding the capital program. And this is the only projects that are authorized under the government code to be included in that calculation are projects for the growth of the city. If it's a replacement of an existing main or an upgrade, it's not authorized. It's only for the growth. So the only people that are paying for that are the people that are causing the city to grow and have to develop that infrastructure. To serve. Okay. Mm -hmm. Of all the towns that you listed, we're the smallest. Yeah. Yes. Population. Do you have any more questions? I have a question. Okay. I have another question. Right. Uh, negotiated a, since Billy brought up the play, do we already have something with them? They were worried about every area of the world. This may affect. This could affect their coming here. If they come in and they don't, and don't agree with the increase. Well, it's not that they want to agree with the increase, but the funny about it is, any any large project, you typically do a creative with them, and you will, depending on what they do, the system to upgrade anything off site, then you will give a certain allowance. So, if they have to take pipe off their premises. And they have to upgrade to a certain size, not just for their capacity, but somebody else adjacent to them because it's only commercial or whatever, then we would, we would give them that allowance. And that all comes in the negotiation. Okay, are there any further questions from council? Or a comment? As, a, as an example on, on Palladium, there are 865 units, and each one will have their own meter. Is that, is that? No, sir. Do you like some of the other apartments where they have a master meter? Okay. Okay, a, a question uh, as far as the amount of increase. Um, you know, I can understand, and we did discuss increases, but $1,000, if we want uh, more housing, shouldn't we maybe rein that in a little bit and do half of that? If, if we want to going to get new housing and you want the infrastructure burden back on the current customer which is our current citizens that's totally within council's parameters if you want to make it equitable to where we're underneath melissa and anna and some of these other cities we're competing with for development then that might be a good decision if you want to bring new customers going to come to us and they want to partake to put the burden on them to upgrade the system as opposed to making it to where we're putting more of the burden on the infrastructure on the people that are already here. How so, will it affect the people already here that wouldn't be getting new meters? Because if we have to pay for upgrades to the system, if we have to upsize any, any sewer lines, if we have to do any new infrastructure, and we can't pay through to pay for it because we haven't got been aggressive on our impact fees, then that rolls back over to our current customers. Well, I've talked to some of the builders and uh, they uh, are not happy and, and uh, are not 
I guess they're considering whether to build in Van Alstine or not. Well, that's and interesting because I'm with quite a few developers and they're the ones who typically pay this and they haven't had any issue with that. I'm talking to smaller, some of the smaller okay. builders, not I, not the uh, Dealer Horton and the different ones that are big. And I'd be happy to visit with them. Because I, I just find that it's a little excessive, a drastic increase. I think we could maybe graduate, you know, do it in a more gradual or graduated uh, process yeah. rather than a but thousand all at once. With our current infrastructure yeah. in the state and see and and the where we are in, in comparison to trunk replacement, um, you're pushing more water through older lines, you're pushing more sewer through older lines. Do we want to put that on the current customer or do we want to or do we want people that are coming in that are going to be moving, building and moving in here? Do we want them to pay their fair share? Oh, I that's, believe that's them, the that's the question really that we're asking ourselves. I believe in them paying their fair share, but what is their fair share? And would that money then that we're getting from them uh, is it fair to fix old uh, the you old can, you infrastructure? Well, that, you can up, you can upsize you can upsize a certain a certain line if that infrastructure is being taxed by new people and new developers. But older parts of town need to be paid for by the current customers because that's who's currently using the system. Yeah, well, that, that's why I think it's not fair to new people then to have to pay uh, that large increase of the thousand dollars. I understand what you're saying, and we and we have a committee that's, that's put together. Uh, I counsel at PNZ plus uh, uh, Mr. Benton, and they evaluated it. That's, that's their recommendation. It ends up coming to council, and y'all are welcome to, to make it okay. anything y'all anything wish. Okay. Okay. Um, can, uh, yes. Uh, one thing I'd like to clear up is the older. If you rebuild a house in the older part of town, this impact the fee wouldn't affect it because the infrastructure is already there. Okay. Then, is that right? It's not, it's not, not a new meter. It's a right. replacement of the meter. If it's, it's, it's a replacement of that service, <coughs> then the infrastructure. I mean, the impact. So, let me see if I've got that right. If, we, if you build a new house in the where old part of the Where an existing house was. Where an existing house was. Then you don't have to pay the then you don't pay an impact fee. No. If the sewer and water is there. If the sewer and water line is there. Yes, if they already been tested. The and that's it. If they already it's have a water meter or a connection to the sewer system, then they can build a new house on that same property and they would not have to pay an impact fee. Okay. Uh, then, uh, would you mind turning the lights back on, please? Okay, then is there a uh, motion uh, regarding this, regarding the land use assumption, capital improvement plan, and impact fees? Make a motion to approve the impact fees and plan use assumption. Offering. The land use assumptions, the capital oh, improvement million. plan, yes. and the impact fee ordinance. Yes. Is there a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Three in favor. Those opposed? Two opposed. Motion passed. Uh, number 12, consider and take any action necessary regarding the appointment of Robert Lloyd Sr. to the Valentine Community Development Corporation Board. Uh, his application was in your packet. Are there any questions regarding this? I'll make a motion that we appoint Robert Lloyd Sr. to the uh, Valentine We have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second it. Is there any further discussion? Any discussion? Then all of those in favor of the appointment, please raise your hand. Three or four. Those opposed? Two. Ab one. Abstain. 
motion passed. At this time, we will have our department reports. Jennifer, do you have anything you wish to report? No, ma'am. Chief Barnes? No, ma'am. Okay. No, ma'am. It'll be a very, very busy schedule in just a matter of weeks with summer distance at the library. I'm going to get the schedule up on the website very soon. And uh, we have them in print otherwise at the library. And we've got something going on almost every day. And I do believe you're going to start the Friends for starting back. Yes, I'm sorry, you're right. First Saturday in June, Friends of the Library Breakfast gets to start back. Woo! Yes. Yeah. So, Fred and Bird are making arrangements to start that back with the first Saturday in June. Thank you. Now we will have uh, the city manager's report. Uh, Mayor Council <coughs> did a walkthrough of the community center today. Uh, we're going to do another one with the building inspector tomorrow. Uh, we're finishing up on uh, the interior. Um, should be able to start occupying and bring out the community center in the next few weeks once we get out everything checked off and cleared up with the insurance company. Still going to be working on the uh, facade um, on the front. It's still, uh, uh, it's not loose, but it's, def it's deformed and it has to be uh, redone. Uh, the fire department still has to be done, as well as uh, the police department's uh, working on uh, fixing their, their ceiling inside. Um, let's see, Chambers already started playing for fall to roll. Uh, Fourth of July this year is uh, going to be the on Friday. It'll be um, at the Van Austin High School, like it was last year. Um, Dr. Spees was very happy with the, resp with the response and, and the support of the booster clubs. So he wanted to, uh, he asked if we would do it, get, do it there again. Um, and so that's what the plan is. Uh, Arts Board meeting uh, Thursday night. Uh, CDC uh, is attempting to, to uh, meet Thursday night. And uh, spoke with Rotary two Thursdays ago, talking about uh, where we are in development and what's going on in Van Alstine. And uh, DR Horton, one of the questions I was asked was about express homes in DR Horton. And so I had an opportunity to ask uh, our current builder uh, today uh, over Gordon what exactly that is. I was familiar with it, and that's what they're doing in some of their homes in Anna. And so what I'm trying to do now is get somebody from Gordon to come and speak to council as far as what does Express Homes mean and what does it bring to Van Austin. Uh, because they're talking about the new 65 lots on the north end being Express Homes. Um, the quick and short that he gave me was that uh, that it's not going to be, there aren't a whole lot of options, that it has most of the upgrades, the granite countertops, the stainless steel appliances, uh, that there aren't a whole lot of options that people would want to modify, um, but that's the short and quick. I, I'd really like somebody from marketing or somebody to come in and, and explain what that mm -hmm. line means exactly to Van Austin and what we'd like to see. Is, I know if you go down to, to Anna, there is there is a difference between D.R. Horton and Anna and a, and a difference between D.R. Horton and Van Alstein and we'd like to maintain that. And, that and Melissa. Melissa. And Melissa, yes sir. So that's that's what I have in my Thank you. Uh, now we will have council's closing comments. Councilman Flake, do you have any? No. Councilman Howard. Councilman Jackson. Uh, then you have the mayor's closing comments, and I want you to know that I was the guest speaker for the second grade of the elementary school. <laughs> <laughs> and I have discovered that the most important question that they asked me was, do I get free food as a mayor? <laughs> And today I attended the volunteer thank you luncheon at the elementary school and had reported to the second grade that the free food was very good. <laughs> so, uh, you never know when you deal with second graders. I also went to ninth grade this, this week. Uh, I received, uh, I have an email from the city manager which uh, states that it's necessary for council to meet no later than May 21st 
to canvass the election and administer the oath of office to the newly elected officials. We will be, uh, council will be meeting on the 19th at City Hall at 9 o'clock. Uh, the can uh, council will canvass the votes and uh, to accept the tally provided and the newly council members will be sworn in at that time so that we can meet the deadline of May the 21st. That is, that concludes my news and comments. At this time, is there a motion that we adjourn? Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All of those in favor of adjourning, please raise your hand. It is unanimous. We are adjourned at 747.